So one of the things I want to point out in these chapters is at the beginning of them, you will see a lot of these national EMS education standard competencies. Uh, they're they're going to be at the start of every single chapter, and what they are is they are based off of a set of standards that the Department of Transportation agrees on every few years as to what a EMS program needs to teach and what the paramedic education needs to entail. So the publisher of the textbook puts these here for you to kind of know uh, how this chapter is going to meet or which of those core competencies or education competencies, I should say, are going to be met by this chapter. These are not to be confused per se with a um, instructional objective or a learning objective in this course. And it, it's more or less how to evaluate whether or not I'm teaching the material that the national or the DOT says I should be teaching you. Um, with that, it's about a 320 page PDF document that lists all of the different competencies, education competencies that paramedics need to have right down to like every single medication that paramedics should be familiar with. It is from those core competencies that are education competencies. I don't know why I keep saying core. It's from those education competencies that the National Registry exam is built off of, and it's what publishers build their textbooks off of, and we build our course courses off of. If you would like that file, it is easily found on the internet, but I could email it to you as well um, if you real if you want to dig through it. Most people don't find it that. Uh, enjoyable unless they have insomnia and they're trying to cure that uh, to read through the 320 pages there. But when we get closer to the end of this course, it could be really helpful if you were wanting to reference what medications do you need to be familiar with in preparations for the National Registry. Um, and I remind you or point out National Registry has the word national in it for a reason. It's because the students in Penn Pennsylvania, students in Texas, students in Mississippi, and students in Georgia are all going to take the same tests or from the same question banks. So the National Registry test is not based on what does the state of Mississippi let you do or what does the state of Georgia allow you to do. <clears throat> um, with that being said, um, when you're taking the National Registry practical test, which I realize is a long way away from you guys, but when you're taking that test, most students will end up taking it in the state that they were educated in, and then means the evaluators that are, you know, the proctoring their test for them are also working in that state. And so they're pretty chill if you're using state protocol saying, hey, this is what I'm allowed to do and this is what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not going to give um, paralytics because I'm not allowed to do that in the state. They'll be OK with that. However, National Registry, you decided you wanted to use a paralytic on your patient. Well, you can because that's in the national scope of practice. So that's uh, that's how that works. Is that a question, Golden Triangle, or stretch? It was a stretch. Okay. <laughs> totally okay. All right, so let's get back to our PowerPoint here. So I'm going to flip through these pretty quick because... Um, Again, these should all these are all available to you. These PowerPoints are all available to you on your... Um, canvas under the different weeks where it lists the chapter. So this would be chapter one, um, the introduction and all that for um, EMS systems. All right. So blah, 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 blah. I do not read PowerPoints to you. I will not do that. Um, you guys have demonstrated the ability to have an a high school education. You can read the PowerPoint. I will talk about what is on that if it is important or needs expanding. Other times it may just be as simple as what is stated. So um, this is interesting right here, TV article, um, TV and newspaper articles. Incidentally, we're gonna see here shortly where TV played a major role in the formation of 911 systems and the organization and consistency of them. 
Now, the rest of these points, patient's previous experience and uh, your treatment of their loved ones, those are not necessarily a reflection on you, but at the same time, they very much can be a reflection on you because you are EMS. And so just because you did the right thing one time doesn't mean, well, okay, so you might not have been the one that offended that person, but you have the opportunity to make it right. You have the opportunity to apologize for that problem, to um, at least empathize with them and say, I understand that was really terrible. I hate that for you. I'm sorry that that was your experience. We're going to do everything we can to make this a better experience, so on and so forth. Remember that every time you go out of that station, you are representing not just yourself, not just your company, but EMS as a whole. You will probably note that newspapers and tv articles not well yeah news articles and online articles love to say paramedics this firefighter that you know they they never it's never here's a guy who did something stupid it's always here's a guy who did something stupid but he was a firefighter so therefore here's a firefighter that did something stupid or here's a paramedic that did something stupid and that is where a huge amount of the um perception of the public comes from. Now, no thanks to programs like uh, Chicago Fire and um, some of these others that are out there right now on TV. Um, I can't even, I don't, I don't know what they're called, but are what they are, but they are some ridiculous programs out there right now. Um, I'll just answer the question because it happens every single class. If you saw it on that show, no, we don't do that and that's not how it goes because i've never once seen anything in that in any of those shows that was remotely close to what we were doing um i watched a, t a show years and years and years ago and they had a paramedic trying to do surgery with spoons in a backyard and i'm like mm -hmm, right so yeah um if you are looking for some uh light uh viewing uh, something light for your viewing pleasure and that is EMS related, check out the uh, USA uh, the uh, USA channel um, network called Sirens, the show Sirens on USA. Oh my gosh, I laugh my butt off every time I watch that show. It is the most realistic, down-to-earth EMS show I've ever seen. Well, next to Emergency, the good old um, Con Ed hours, but... Uh, yeah, that's that's a good show. So, all right, back to our course. I'm going to, I yeah, I get distracted. Sorry. So you always, if you feel like I'm uh, sidetracked, just say something. All right, well, continued education. We'll get into that later on. Um, that's a quick question, though. How many in of you in some way shape or form as ems providers have felt like you were a underappreciated segment of the medical field mistreated or um just undervalued by other medical providers in general and i agree 100 percent. i'd have my hand up there too it is very common for us to feel like that well, I've heard a lot of really good uh, lectures on this topic, and so I don't want to step on anybody's toes here, but I do want to point out that oftentimes when we are not feeling like we are respected by other people, we need to, we should give the consideration to, are we respecting ourselves? I used to actually talk along the lines of if we want to be respected, we need to give respect. And I've read some really good information on that where it kind of points to different definitions of respect. And so I don't really go that direction as much anymore. But I feel strongly that if we as an industry want to be respected, then we as an industry must learn to respect ourselves. And whether that's in the way we dress, the way we keep our equipment, the way we talk, the way we behave in public. but foremost i think in the way we take pride in our um our education our continuing education and our patient care 
Uh, I think one of the most dangerous mistakes that we can make as paramedics is believe the lie that we only have the patient for 15 minutes and all we have to do is get them to the hospital alive. Because if that's our bar, that's a pretty low bar. And for the most part, I would say 90% of our patients could probably get to the hospital alive in the back of an Uber. Not necessarily a reflection on us or the Uber drivers, probably just a matter of the patients didn't need to call us, but if that's our bar, that's pretty low. And what we need to do is find a way to improve ourselves and improve our, because we say, oh, the industry's flawed. Well, we are the industry. We are the individuals within the industry and we are what needs to make this industry better. Uh, when I went to a critical care program once, the they it was stated towards the beginning of the class that the goal and purpose of critical care paramedics was to take a patient from one ICU to another ICU with the patient never knowing that they had left the ICU. And when you think about that, what that means, it's it's kind of profound. Like you as the paramedic are providing a level of care that is from, from a physiologic standpoint for the patient commensurate to what they were receiving in the ICU. Granted, it was for a very short period of time. You weren't having to do a whole lot of titrations or changes or anything like that. It was mostly maintaining a status quo. But the intention is for our patients to never realize that they weren't receiving medical care or that they weren't receiving the same level of medical care. Many of you, in fact, nearly all of you are in private EMS to some sort. You're going to do inter-facility transports. Very likely you will see critical care inter-facility transports into your future and may already in some way do that. That is great. Um, but ask yourself, does that patient's vital signs know, indicate that their body knows that they left the ICU? Did they do worse while they were in our care? I'm not knocking anybody's patient care, any of you. I don't know you yet, but I'm saying this is a question that we should be asking ourselves. These are things that we should look at to see how we can improve and always be looking for ways to improve. All right. So here's a couple of names, um, individuals who played a big role in the organization of EMS in the early uh, ideas here, um, probably recognized uh, the name Dr. Nancy Caroline, one of the earliest authors of textbooks. In fact, the textbook that we're using is Nancy Caroline's Emergency Care in the Streets and is based off the, the original works published by her. Oops, going the wrong direction here. All right, some good old history facts for you. Fortunately for you, you will not have to remember any of these dates as far as your test goes. Um, these are some ideas and some background that would be helpful to just be familiar with in the organization, um, but the actual dates are not significant. So don't stress yourself out on that. All right, so as you can see, 1487, ambulances have been used since 1487. Um, and uh, to give a reference that was only about 200 years after the um, bubonic plague. So it wasn't that long ago, or, or it was, excuse me, it was quite a long time ago. Of course, then we see 1800s, they start doing pre-hospital systems for triaging transport patients, and then we start to see stuff progress from there more rapidly. Does anybody know or remember from maybe from your EMT school, what is the major push or developer of EMS systems? What events typically have caused growth in EMS? War? Yep, and that's, a, that's absolutely right. Most of your early EMS programs were developed on the battlefields by um, generals and surgeons trying to um, uh, decrease their number of casualties, and then when the soldiers get come home from the war, they implement the same concepts in their hometowns as an effort to improve the life of their neighbors. <clears throat> so that's where a lot of this stuff comes in, and that's why, as you can see in 1926, 
a lot of EMS systems very similar to what we have today were starting to develop across the United States. Um, these were soldiers returning from World War I. Of course, they'd been home for probably about eight years now, and they were starting to develop systems where motorized ambulances and transporting patients to the hospital. Of course, in 1940s, it started to be combined with EMS. Important thing to note is at this point in time in the 40s, yes, there were ambulances. Yes, there were EMS systems, but there were no direct standards. So you call an ambulance in the state of New York and you call an ambulance in the state of Texas, you may get very different responses and or may not get a response depending on where you are in the state. And so that was a... Um, it, it took it was probably another 20 years before that was really recognized as being the problem so of course ems made um in world war ii this came from your combat medicine uh science was really starting to progress in the field of medicine they were understanding physiology better surgeries were being more effective we had very commonplace uh use of anesthesias um Instead, not everything was simply being amputated. Reconstructive surgeries were starting. Um, and so these were being implemented in the field, and these comp concepts were starting to return back to the, uh, to the states, to the um, home front. Korean War, shortly after that, early 1950s, we saw our first use of helicopters. Um, this was popularized um, as a concept that we're probably familiar with with the uh, TV show MASH and how that um, kind of just demonstrating what was going on there. Now, contrary to what Hollywood likes to put in front of us now, check out when the first time mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation was developed in the idea of CPR, 1956. So much, much later than a lot of uh, shows try to uh, demonstrate. All right, so here you can see in the 50s and 60s, this is where the concept of paramedics started to come into. This was where uh, doctors at hospitals started recognizing that patients who received pre-hospital care would have better outcomes in the long run and started coming up with protocols essentially that would allow hospital care to be carried out into the field. And that's where your term mobile intensive care units come from. Anybody worked on a MICU before? Worked somewhere where that was a term common? So interestingly enough, when I worked in Pennsylvania, the ambulances were a EMT basic or two EMT basics or an EMT basic and a first responder. That was an ambulance. A MICU had an EMT basic and a paramedic on it. So basically an ALS ambulance was considered a MICU in that state. All right, 1965, the federal government finally decided to get involved in EMS, and this was with the publishing of what's now referred to as the White Paper. Notice on this, it is a paper, it is a study that is demonstrating issues that they found. It actually had um, very little in the form of recommendations. It said there is no uniform law, there is no equipment standard. There are uh, and very poor equipment, if there is any. There is no communication between hospitals and ambulances or ambulance services. There is no training or very little and poor uh, spotty training. And in general, they are part time or volunteer only. This was the big recognition to we have a system that could be very effective, but is unregulated and nobody has stepped up to the plate to make this work. So 10 critical points of what an EMS system needed. And in, uh, as you can see here, 1968, this is when they created the National Highway Safety Act. Um, so U.S. Department of Transportation built this system on the concept that, and, and what they actually used was a study that pointed to the, um, if I remember correct, it was the, the white paper had the other name that was something along the lines of the death and disability, the unknown um, disease or the unrecognized disease on the highway or something like that. It was basically pointing out to, that we had in the early 1960s, a lot of people dying on the interstates. Um, if you recall, interstates were built in the late 1950s. 
Uh, but most of the rest of the country was still using highways and such that had been built in the 20s and 30s uh, with the uh, New Deal and a lot of the um, government projects to try to give people jobs during the Great Depression. Well, if you know anything about automotive history and all that, you'll probably remember that in the 20s and 30s, most of the cars were designed to do like 30 miles an hour maybe 40, maybe 50, but rarely much more than 30, 35 miles an hour. That was considered fast. Well, in the 60s, what do we know about 60s, guys? Muscle cars. And people are still trying to get a hold of those today and uh, soup them up and tune them out. These cars were going incredible speeds. They weren't 35 mile an hour cars. They were even upwards of 100 or more. And now they're driving on roads that were designed for 35 mile an hour cars. This is where we were having massive amounts of wrecks and deaths. And the Department of Transportation felt that a major aspect of this or a, a possible solution or part of the solution was to improve first responders um, capabilities. And so what the Department of Transportation did said, this is what EMS needs to look like. This is levels of training, this is equipment they should have, and that is where the first national scope of practice for first aid, for first, aid first responders came from. Of course, 1968, as you can see, things started to implement. 1991, or 911, excuse me, in some areas of the country still is not fully functional. Um, and in a lot of parts of the country, even up until the early 2000s, they still didn't have a uh, 911 system. And it, because each county, each area has to implement that system on their own. So, 1969, first paramedic program, as you can see here with the city of Miami. City of Miami Fire Department, one of the doctors down there, he decided to um, take the EMT level training that had existed and add additional skills to it and try to create what became known as the paramedic program. Uh, Los Angeles County Fire Department uh, saw this, caught on to it. Some of the doctors out there at Rampart Hospital uh, jumped on board with that plan and they developed a paramedic program as well. And around the same time Seattle, Washington, was, and Seattle Fire Department was developing a program. Y'all remember the show Emergency? old 70s show, uh, black and white, uh, Squad 51, and all that kind of stuff. If you get a chance, look it up. The first episode of that TV series, you can find it on YouTube, but the first episode is like a two-hour long episode, and it's completely about the formation of the paramedic program in Los Angeles County Fire Department. It's really interesting because you have Johnny and Roy, the two main characters in the paramedic school, but everybody else, all the other firefighters that are in the paramedic program in the show are the actual firefighters who were in the very first paramedic program. Um, and they were teaching Johnny and Roy during the show how to be paramedics. Uh, because they were the ones in the class. And so that is an incredibly good look at what paramedic school looked like at the beginning of the uh, program. So just a weird little history tidbit there that you could enjoy. Um, the first episode's pretty cool. National Registry. We'll talk a lot more about registry later on as far as its organization. So here you can see in the 70s, we started seeing a whole lot more stuff took place. Um, the first textbooks by American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons came out, AOS. This is the original version of the textbook um, that we have a variation of today. Um, so, uh, National Standard Curriculum started in 1977. So they took the recommendations from DOT um, in, let's see, go back. Oops, wrong direction. Right here in... Um, with the white paper in DOT, and then in 77, so it was a while later, before this first national standard curriculum was uh, developed. And now, instead of just saying, this is what EMS should be able to do, this is how they should be teaching. And those national education competencies I was talking about earlier, that's this was the first iteration of those in the 70s. All right, so as you can see, things started growing a lot faster in the 80s and 90s. Um, not much uh, happened there during that. Uh, 
super big. It was more like EMS was just coming of age and um, growing into what we know of it today. All right, so these are some various things that are on the front, or excuse me, on the horizon for EMS. The EMS Compass is a more or less like a council that meets uh, every, of course, I'm going to blank now. I think it's every 10 years. And what they do is set goals and visions for EMS as an industry to say, you know, in the next 10 years, we want to be at this point. So, you know, a while back, they set the goal that we want paramedicine uh, paramedics to be an accredited program. Hence, we are now in programs that are accredited. They have things on there like they want paramedicine to be a degreed program. Um, they These uh, types of organizations and these types of goals are what serve to push the industry forward and gain it professional um, recognition. Um, we like to complain about the fact that we don't make very much money. And though it's probably true for most of us, it's very much related to the fact that our industry as a whole has not been built from a professional standpoint and our standards are particularly lower than a lot of other um, professional industries or professional jobs that are parallel to us for example nursing so ems compass and things like that are trying to push our industry towards gaining that professionalism in a credit um in, and respect and income Community paramedicine. Has anybody had the opportunity to work with one of these programs, a community paramedicine program? Are they, do you know or have heard of any of those in Mississippi? Okay, so there's a couple here in Georgia and the greater Atlanta area. Uh, I know Clayton County has developed one specifically. Can't speak to any off uh, top of my head otherwise. What these are, are they um, putting nurse practitioners on ambulances or chase cars to go out into the field and do initial, well, not initial, do complete screening of pa many of the patients that would have otherwise gone to the ER for just minor conditions like pneumonia or a head cold or um, various other issues. They can draw blood, they can shoot x-rays, they can write prescriptions for like antibiotics and stuff, so minor infections. So what they're doing is trying to take a lot of the load off of the hospitals by providing this care um, in a pre-hospital setting at a standard of care greater than what the average ALS ambulance is capable of. So licensure certification and registration. What do we know about this? Somebody from Athens, tell me what a licensure is. Looking at you, Athens. When you pass your national record saying that you've completed everything. Mm, close. Not quite, though. Anybody else want to take a second shot at it? There you go. So after you take a national registry and you've passed everything, you get licensure within your state. Licensure is a legal designation. The state has legally allowed you to uh, operate as a paramedic. Now, certification is what you guys took this morning. You all took a CPR test that certified you to be able to do CPR. So certification, National Registry's test is very much a certification test. Um, these are tests that are cumulative over a set amount of information to determine, do you have a working knowledge of this information? They certify that you know the material. And then you, with that certification, you can go to the state of whichever state you live in and say, hey, I have this certification, please license me to operate as a healthcare provider. And that's how that works. So licensing comes as a legal, um, is a legal aspect set by the state where certification is normally established by a non-government body that determines you are familiar with this information. Now, registration, so the net we call I said a minute ago that National Registry is a certifying test. The test is a certification test. The organization National Registry is a registering body. It is a um 
it is a core organization that tracks all of the EMS companies, all of the providers that sign up for it, and more or less puts their finger on the pulse of the industry. They are they keep records on what's the average amount of education people are getting, what's the average amount of con ed are people getting, how many hours are they working, how many hours, uh, what types of jobs do they have, are they getting paid, are they volunteer, and they just keep data about the industry as a whole. So they're very helpful Organ, type of organization when you're trying to say, is EMS working? Do we need to change it? What has EMS done in the last 10 years? How has it changed? They can show you that kind of information. So, all right. So I kind of talked about certification exams, talked about licensure. Okay, good, covered that. Oh, COEMS, all right. So this is an organization that determines or accredits the education courses. Um, so paramedic schools, whether it's a uh, private school like Faithful Guardian or a state school like um, a technical college or something like that, they will get a COEMS accreditation indicating that they have met a third party standard of education. And that third party, uh, and that all of their information is subject for review and um, evaluation by the um, by that body. So COEMS can show up at any time. They show up on regular scheduled times, but they could also show up at any time here to the school and say, we want to see all the records on this class, or we want to see all the records by the from this instructor, or we want to, you know, we want to see your course syllabuses or your schedules. And they're the ones that make certain that we hold to the agreement that we made, that we are teaching you what we said we were going to teach you. They're the ones that'll get mad if I let you go home early. So, because we all know you won't get mad, right? All right, so let's see what we got. Oh, reciprocity. We good on that? Confusions there? Everybody know what reciprocity is? All right, I got some th thumbs up. I got some heads down over there in, um, looks like uh, Conyers got some heads on the table. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Here's some various options for EMS employment. Cool. I've worked fire-based, third service, private, hospital-based, and more or less a hybrid. So I've pretty much worked in all of these organizations or types of organizations in some way or shape or form. So... Um, honestly, for 911 EMS, I would say that fire-based EMS is my preference. I feel like f as far as the patients are concerned, the level of response, the response times, the uh, and such like that, fire-based EMS does a really good job with that. The argument can be made that a private service that is only EMS can be more focused on their EMS care and provide a higher level of uh, care or better quality care, better education. It's, you know, it's what you guys work in and I can understand that, I agree. There's some thought there, but um, anybody here ever run non-emergency calls? Exactly. Guess what I don't have to do at Firebase DMS? So, not that I'm bragging, that's not the point here. The point is, when an ambulance is doing a non-emergency call, that's an ambulance that's not available for a 911 call. It is the nature of the beast. It is how the system works. It is what we do. It is how we are paid, and that's okay. But for the patient's care, for the citizen's response, I think Firebase DMS is really good. But when I worked private EMS, I found that the quality of the equipment that we had available to us could be significantly better. Now, that's not across the board. I've definitely worked at some private EMS services that the quality of our equipment lacked significantly. So lots of variations there. Hospital-based EMS systems are a really interesting opportunity, especially when they're well integrated with the ER and such, because there's a lot more opportunity for heavier education, um, better education, and better understanding between the crews and the staff. 
course, that all going to boil down to is we'll see how you as a person interact with the other, um, with the staff that you come in contact with. All right. Um, get a, give me just a few more minutes and we'll take a break. All right. I think that the public definitely has figured out how to activate the EMS system. What they have not yet figured out is how to recognize an emergency. That is where they seem to heavily uh, lack. And so we probably could do a better job of helping them understand what is not an emergency um, and providing basic care. Now, which of these, if we're looking at all of these lists here, there's eight, op eight points. There's only a few of these that we really have control over. And that would start here at pre-hospital assessment and care, our transportation, and an emergency department, um, excuse me, our transportation. But I argue that we also have some influence over definitive care. The reason I don't include responses, although us getting out of the easy chair and onto the truck, yes, that's a big part of it. We can't always control how far away from the scene we are. And that that's just a set amount of time. Just It's where the chips fall. It's how far away we are. Bystander care, dispatchers, that's somebody else. We can definitely do a good job on our pre-hospital assessments and our pre-hospital care and transportation, in those, but our transportation is limited on how far we are. We can't necessarily run warp speed. Now, we don't, we don't get a say in how our emergency care, or excuse me, emergency department care is, but we kind of do in which emergency department we transport to. And I'm not here to bash any hospital, but we've probably all learned that there are different, that not all hospitals are created equal and not all emergency departments are, have the same capabilities. And beyond that, not all hospital um, operating rooms have the same capabilities. Uh, here in my area, there's certain hospitals that we know we don't take orthopedic problems to. They don't have orthopedics. Now, they have a great heart facility, but they don't have orthopedic surgeons. So any hip fractures, leg fractures, anything like that, they've got it. somebody that's going to need ortho surgery, they've got to go to a different facility. And so we can play a big role in the definitive care, and this is them getting the final fix, not the stabilization of the ER, but the final care that they need. We play a big role in that by selecting the initial hospital we go to. When I worked private EMS, it didn't take long to figure out that if you took a patient to the local hospital when they really needed to go to a neuro center or a trauma center or something, well, it wasn't very long and they were calling back and now you get to write a second PCR as you transfer inner facility this patient from the local to the trauma center. So something to consider, it's better for you to drive an extra 40 minutes with a stroke per se, you know, for an example, then it might be for you to drive the 10 minutes to the local hospital and let that patient sit there for an hour so that you can then pick them up and take them the other 40 minutes to the other hospital. Does that make sense? Now, there's always caveats. There's always issues. Welcome to paramedic school. There is no right or wrong. There never will be a, this always works. As I've always said, it's 50 shades of gray because there are circumstances where I absolutely will take that stroke to the first hospital. We know that the patient is 90 years old, they've had three other strokes, they have little to no function, and they're already on blood thinners. Well, I know for a fact that they're not going to do surgery, and I know that they're not going to, and they probably won't be doing clot busters, so there's no chance that going to the neuro center is going to help this patient. Well, another example would be, I can't get an airway. This patient's air, airway is um, threatened, whether it's from vomit or something like that, and I can't secure it permanently. I need to go to the closest hospital, get an airway so that we can transfer to another facility. So there's always caveats that we have to consider when trying to decide where we transport to. All right, so we all know what a dispatcher is. This is your role in a very succinct, develop a care plan and determine the most appropriate facility. How do we develop the care plan? Well, we do a good assessment, we know our protocols, and we move on from there.
All right, so now we're gonna get into levels of education. Before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys a break. Uh, so let's take a five minute break or so, and we'll see how everybody's doing, all right?